Hey everyone, it's Heather Darnell. Welcome back to my art channel. Thank you for joining me for another video. So I, about a year ago or so, I came across this video on the, from this woman that I follow named Rinska Downa. You probably follow her too, an abstract fluid artist. Anyway, so she did this painting that I believe she called uh, Ocean Chaos. And when I saw it back then, it had stuck with me. And today I wanted to give it a try for myself. Um, now, when I say Ocean Chaos, it's because the color palette she chose basically very ocean themed, color themed, and chaos representing the random pouring and just kind of blowing out crazy everywhere. So I definitely enjoyed that, but I didn't look at that as more of a, a, a chaos type painting. I, I did because I, I was picking up what she was putting down, but I saw it more as going into the abyss because it's so dark, at least the way it dried, and just imagining all those crazy things that you find so deep under the water. But before we get started, today's ministry snack is an unusual, well, the message isn't unusual, the method to how I achieved the uh, obtaining the material to get the message together is not one of my usual ways. Normally, I just, you know, have a couple of verses for you there and I go from there. Um, but this time I actually had to like, take a bunch out and it, I say that because the ones that I took out are very, they're just a bunch of names, you're welcome, <laughs> and or they're very repetitive to the verses I am providing. So I just thought I would take out what's significant or most impactful and sandwich it together and go from there. So they're from the book of Numbers chapters uh, 13 verses 1 to 2, 17 to 20, 27 to 33, and then chapter 14 verses 1 to 10. And it reads, the Lord spoke to Moses saying, send men out to spy the land of Canaan, which I'm giving to the people of Israel. From each tribe of their fathers, you shall send a man, every one a chief among them. Moses sent them to spy out the land of Canaan and said to them, go up into the Negev and go up into the hill country and see what the land is and whether the people who dwell in it are strong or weak, whether there are few or many, and whether the land that they dwell in is good or bad, and whether the cities that they dwell in are camps or strongholds, and whether the land is rich or poor, and whether there are trees in it or not, be of good courage and bring some of the fruit of the land. Now the time was the season of the first ripe grapes. And they told him, we came to the land which you sent us. It flows with milk and honey, and this is the fruit. However, the people who dwell in the land are strong and the cities are fortified and very large. And besides, we saw the descendants of Anak there. The Amalekites dwell in the land of the Negev. The Hittites, the Jebusites, and the Amorites dwell in the hill of the country. And the Canaanites dwell by the sea along the Jordan. But Caleb quieted the people before Moses and said, Let us go up at once and occupy it, for we are well able to overcome it. Then the man who had gone up with him said, well, We are not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we are. So they brought to the people of Israel a bad report of the land that they had spied out, saying, The land, though which we have gone to spy it out, is a land that devours its inhabitants, and all the people that we saw in it are of great height. And there we saw the Nephilim, the sons of Anak, who come from the Nephilim, and we seemed to ourselves like grasshoppers, and so we seemed to them. Then all the congregation raised a loud cry, and the people wept that night. And the people of Israel grumbled against Moses and Aaron. The whole congregation said to them, Would that we had died in the land of Egypt, or would that had we had died in this wilderness? Why is the Lord bringing us into this land, to fall by the sword, our wives and our little ones to become prey? Would it not be better for us to go back to Egypt? And they said to one another, Let us choose a leader to go back to Egypt. Then Moses and Aaron fell on their faces before all the assembly of the congregation of the people of Israel. And Joshua the son of Nun and Caleb the son of Jephunneh, who were among those who had spied out the land, tore their clothes and said to all the congregation of the people of Israel, The land which we pass through to spy it out is exceedingly good land. If the Lord delights in us, he will bring us into the land and give it to us, a land that flows with milk and honey. Only do not rebel against the Lord and do not fear the people of the land, for they are bred for us. Their protection is removed from them and the Lord is with us. Do not fear them. Then all the congregation said to stone them with stones. But the glory of the Lord appeared at the tent of the meeting to all the people of Israel. Okay, so right after God rescued his people out of the land of Egypt, he was immediately leading them to the promised land, a land of full blessing, a land where he describes many times in the Bible as a place flowing with milk and honey, and a place where he continues to describe and pretty much gives everybody the understanding that it has some pretty awesome vegetation, uh, comfortable weather, tons of fresh water, room for everyone and their livestock, 
and a place where our Heavenly Father was going to willingly reside His holy presence with His chosen people. But unfortunately and sadly, not too long into the travels to the Promised Land, the Israelites became um, disobedient, impatient, defiant, ungrateful, whiny and complaining, greedy, um, immoral. I mean, does anybody else feel convicted already? Because I know I am guilty as charged on every account on so many occasions. I mean, totally, I'm a work in progress, thank goodness. But really, think about this laundry list of things that displeases the Lord and how we are all just as equally as guilty. So even though they were going to be temporarily living uncomfortably, um, God was still going to provide everything they need. He was going to give them provisions out the wazoo. Um, so not necessarily everything that they wanted, but everything that they need. He knows exactly what they need. He knows exactly what we need. He is a good God. It's just unfortunate that we tend to mix up the things that we want with the things that we need. And then therefore we start spinning our wheels and really thinking and questioning him, et cetera, et cetera. Again, he did this just to realign their focus on him and not things or their current circumstance of traveling uncomfortably. Plus, it's way better than being a slave anyway, which unfortunately, a lot of them ended up being um, comparing their current circumstance of traveling uncomfortably as being worse than a slave. Now, in this part of the scripture, God basically brings the Israelites right up to the border. I mean, right up to the fence line. They are so close at this point, they can practically smell the roses. But anyways, uh, God spoke to Moses and he told him, hey, this is what I need you to do. I need you to send uh, some guys out and I need you to have them check out this land of Canaan over here, the land that I'm going to give you and all the people of Israel. Now take note of the word he said, give. Not I'm going to give it to you after you work for it or anything like that. He said, I'm just going to give it to you. Now think about that. How fantastic is that? That's the God we serve. He gives his people a land. So they just automatically receive it just because he feels like it. And they get to receive all of his glory and goodness within that land just because he loves his people, just because he loves us. You guys think about all the glory and goodness he's done in our lives. But anyway, so these people that were sent out are from the 12 tribes of Israel. Now, Jacob is the guy who had Joseph, um, which is known, at, or he's known to be the dreamer. Um, and he was the one I was talking about in my painting where I did an interpretation of what Shifra and Pua could have looked like. Anyway, so it's Joseph and all his brothers and their sons and so on and so forth that make up the 12 tribes of Israel. So they go out on Moses' command, which was given by God, to have these guys go out and secretly survey the environment, uh, check out the land, the people, the food, the uh, resources, basically go out and scope out every little detail of the land and come back and tell Moses and Aaron all about it. Now take note that God already knows who's in the land, what's in the land, and Moses pretty much already has a good idea as well. Uh, it's said in the Bible that um, Moses and God were pretty much like this. I mean. Moses had the, the privilege of being in God's full glory, his presence, you know, and it, it was so amazing that it, Moses' face was literally shining. I mean, my little camera lights here don't, don't give the description in the Bible a justice. But anyways, it, it notes the relationship that God and Moses had to the point they were literally talking like they were friends. I mean, think about how you talk to your friends. You just kind of let your hair down and you talk about whatever because you're comfortable with each other. You know, you can really be real. And that was Moses' relationship with God. So yeah, God's basically going to tell him what he's going to inherit. Therefore, that why Moses and his brother Aaron were constantly being encouraging to the people because they knew what God was going to bring them into was going to be pretty awesome. You know, he wasn't going to bring them into a dump. And that's the kind of relationship he wants with us too. So again, I know I want to want a little squirrel moment there, but the whole point is to remind everybody that God is omniscient. So he didn't send the spies in to find out what the land is like because he didn't already know. He sent the spies in because he was hoping that they would see the things that God wants them to see. 
that they would remember his promise of the very land he's going to give them and remember the promise he gave them that he delivered them or that he was going to deliver them out of Egypt in which he did. So of course the spies go and check it out and uh, see that the land is indeed stupendous and about 40 days pass they come back with some fruit with them as commanded to basically prove to everyone that God was right. They were going to hit the jackpot. And so they proceed to tell Moses, his brother Aaron, and all the people of the congregation about all the goodies and the perks within the land, that it does have milk and honey flowing, that the fruit is obviously off the charts as they're all like licking their fingers and savoring every bite. But then they just kind of unfortunately and immediately backpedal and want them to shift their focus from everything positive into being negative. So they had that whole little um, motion or type thing of going, you didn't see anything and redirect everyone's attention to the people that they saw there. So they were like, yeah, so here's the thing now. Pay attention to this, everyone. Don't think about anybody else, but think about this. There's these people there and they're big. They're the descendants of Anak. They're the Amalekites. Now the Amalekites were not small people, so yes, he was being very truthful there. Um, but they were to be larger than our large people here. So when we think of Shaquille O'Neal and he's like seven foot plus or something like that, these people would tower over him and people that have a larger build, um, typically are athletes and stuff that we know of. So the giant that um, little boy David, shepherd boy David fought, um, Goliath, his height was noted to be around nine foot six. I believe he was a Namalekite, he was a Philistine, um, but yeah, that was his height. So it wasn't like they were facing people that just happened to wear what, like a triple XL in their clothes. Now the Amalekites were supposed to be utterly wiped out all the way back in the Old Testament. So back in the book of First Samuel, God spoke to King Saul at the time and was like, hey, the Amalekites, they need to be gone. Every last one of them down to the livestock. You hear me? You got this? And King Saul was like, yeah, sure, no problem. Totally. And end up unfortunately doing his own thing, yet claiming he followed every single rule and command. But what he ended up doing was cherry picking. Hence the cherry picking left remnants of the Amalekites and therefore is why they are a continuing ongoing issue and a thorn in the side to the Israelites. I mean, he wanted, God wanted them all gone, even the children, which sounds horrible, but those children were to grow up and be a part of the whole agenda to completely and utterly annihilate God's chosen people. So you can see he didn't want nothing to do with that. He wanted nothing to do with them. You can see that's, that's why they're not exactly on his VIP list. It makes sense now why he removed their protection. So had King Saul just listened to what God said from the get-go, none of these shenanigans and ordeals would be around for the Israelites to deal with. Now remember, God doesn't have obstacles. He just didn't want for anybody, any of his chosen people, including us, to have any obstacles. So back to the spies. Uh, but instead of them going on about the wonderful things they had encountered and had brought back as proof, they decided to switch gears and go from being super encouraging to being a negative Nancy. So they were going on in an overall negative report instead, literally just instilling fear, um, and getting the, the congregation to redirect their focus off the wonderful things that they had seen and tasted uh, to focus instead on the inhabitants that dwell there as they described them as very large, they have great height, they were stronger than us, we're like grasshoppers to them. I mean, they were just going on and on and on down the list. I mean, it's sad because if you tell somebody something enough times or if you say enough things, they're going to believe it, good or bad. So you can see in this case here, they were just going on about the bad things, which weren't supposed to be focused on anyways. But so while the 10 of the spies were just blabbing, Caleb and Joshua are sitting there like how Dr. Evil humorous, humorously and famously gives that gesture when he's like, right. <laughs> like they didn't deny there were some big guys there. They were totally honest about that, but that's not what they're 
focus was they were like so now these 10 guys are basically running their mouths just ruining everything for the whole congregation and caleb has had enough to hear and so he just jumps in and pulls another humorous dr evil moment and just tries to shush them just silence them just zip it shush, 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 every time they try to spew out more bad news and so instead caleb is the friend that you want among the group because here he's being super encouraging he's being uplifting and he's reminding the people and telling them instead to just come off their little you know problem horse there and just never mind the inhabitants we could take them on they're bread for us we could just totally eat them up you know their protection is removed God said he's gonna give us the land all we have to do is just show up you know and we're right there you know and more importantly moreover God said do not rebel against me so why don't we just think about what we've done in the past because this again is a friendly reminder to the people to not go back in a backslidden direction, meaning don't distance yourself from God, don't slip away from him, because when that happens, bad choices and everything else under the umbrella of sin take over. And so they've already experienced the taste of the consequences of being rebellious, and he just doesn't want that for them, and I don't blame him, I wouldn't wanna be a part of that either. Funny how they were told before going in to have courage, you know, take some fruit too, take home some exhibits to bring us and show us. And they did that, no problem, with no fear, and they were completely outnumbered at the same time. So it just doesn't make sense. Yet somehow now, you know, they, they lose their courage and instead the people switch their mindset again from being totally pumped to completely being in dread and in fear, all thanks to these 10 spies who are ultimately fear-mongering. You know, therefore they raised a loud cry and they boo-hooed and wept all night over nothing. You know what I mean? Does this sound familiar? I mean, just it really everybody does the same thing to date, again, myself included. I mean, this really we really don't sound any different. So they grumbled against Moses as if it was his idea when it was God's command. Another example how we like to put the blame on someone else. We like to conveniently dump our negativity on someone else so we don't have to deal with it and to look back at ourselves like we were scot-free and good to go. That is how we are constantly in a backslidden motion. We are never moving forward in our relationship with God because we are so focused on not dealing with our own junk or our own dirty laundry, you know what I mean? And so when we do exactly what the Israelites are doing here, dumping blame on Moses and Aaron, they are just really missing the whole picture, as do we because it is our choice to look at the glass as half empty. It is our choice to use our time and energy um, in a negative way. So thanks to these 10 spies and their fear mongering and all, somehow managed to paint a really bad picture of the promised land to the congregation or to the people of Israel to the point they just wanted Moses and Aaron dead. Now, how sad is that? They wanted to literally take the lives of the two men that were constantly speaking up on their behalf, constantly giving them words of encouragement. And that's the payback. That's what they want to do. Or, you know what I mean? That's the attempt they started to um, move forward to. It's, on top of that, they just felt like it would be easier to live life back in Egypt with whips and chains and affliction and burden with heavy labor. Seriously, they actually felt like that even after all God's done for them and brought them out of the land of Egypt. I mean, I don't know how some po at some point they just became cross-eyed and forgot that God parted the Red Sea for them. He rained food from heaven as in it magically appeared at the little tent door. They didn't have to hunt or lift a finger. He made sure they had fresh water, food, protection. He even gave them mercy when they were completely defiant and disobedient. I mean, you know what I mean? He was ready, he was brewing anger, you guys. And Moses interceded on their behalf on a number of occasions, just basically tell him to just chill out for a few minutes. Everybody's kind of going, you know, willy nilly and just needs a breather. And God honored Moses' his request. He should have wiped them out. They deserve it, just like we deserve it. I mean, we are a, a defiant, unholy, um, adulterous, backslidden nation. You know, we are stiff-necked and all, and it is by His grace, people, that we still stand. So as you can see, God has mercy on us too. And you better pray he keeps his mercy up because at any point you never know when he'll just show his bright and shiny face again um, and just be done with all of our shenanigans. But the, the point is, it's really sad how the Israelites focused on that and just would honestly think 
that they that God would bring them up so close and personal to the gates of the promised land of full blessings um, and all and then just be like oh psych <laughs> just kidding that really wasn't for you I was just trying to see if I can get a rise out of you you know that they were just gonna rot and die outside of the wilderness you know and be like too bad so sad so you can see how irrational they were being how dramatic they were being and we are no different you guys again I'm cutting myself up here I'm no different on so many times what a great reminder how I need to step it up in my ways to honor and serve the Lord better rather than just run in my mouth. So the big question is, what are we to take away from all of this? Well, first, let's stop making God number two and removing our trust and our faith in him. And let's stop living in fear. You guys, the enemy thrives on that. He thrives when we separate ourselves from God and from each other. Second, he didn't say that life was gonna be a piece of cake. But when we submit and give ourselves to him, it'll be pretty darn close. Third, he allows the scary things in life, the ugly things in life, the hard times in life to exist simply so we come to him in boldness and in confidence and ask him to please find favor in us and to help us overcome our fears so that he can keep us safe and deliver us. He delights in answering our prayers and he delights in making what was meant to be bad or look bad from the enemy and turn it into something good. But most of us shortchange him and put the limits on the one who has none. Therefore, we never get to experience the full truth and richness in God's capability. Fourth, he wants us to constantly look how God is going out of his way for us, the way he did for his people. Remember, he gave them a sample of his fruit, a sample of the goodness before they even got into the promised land so that they would be reminded that the abundance of fruit and land is larger than the giants that inhabited there. But instead, they decided to zero in on what is puny in God's eyes and ended up doubting him as far as being able to take care of it. Remember, doubt came on as early as the book of Genesis in the time of Adam and Eve, when the serpent was searching for an entryway into Eve's heart to get her to turn towards sin and ultimately doubt God. He made her focus on the one thing in the entire garden that wasn't meant to be focused on. He put thoughts in her head to distract her and to redirect her onto a difficult path for the rest of her life. He also wanted her to be distant from God the way he wants all of us to be distant from God. So you can see the way that he fights us isn't by literal physical fists and punches, you know, but rather a mental sucker punch, so to speak, to our head and our hearts. So as you can see, he doesn't even lift a finger, but yet his voice is literally deadly. He whispers and instills words into us to kill our relationship with God, the way we use words to kill our relationship with God and with other people too. Now sit with this with what Jesus' brother James said. So in the book of James chapter 3, verses 7 through 10, it reads, For every kind of beast and bird, of every reptile and sea creature, can be tamed and has been tamed by mankind, but no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil, full of deadly poison. With it, we bless our Lord and Father, and with it, we curse people who are made in the likeliness of God. From the same mouth come blessing and cursing. My brothers, these things ought not to be so. So you can see how we're able to calm any creature down. We're able to tame it to our liking, yet we can't even tame our own tongue. And when we don't seek the guidance and direction of our Heavenly Father, we are basically setting ourselves up for destruction, disappointment, and failure. And not just ourselves, but others and the Lord himself with all of our grumbling and our doubting that goes with it. And then we wonder why our life sucks, because the same voice gets us to doubt that prayer is effective. Again, because the enemy wants to keep us distant from God. So that means having no relationship, no kind of protection, and certainly no inheritance in heaven. He wants us to think that when we ask people for prayer, that they're basically going to think, you know, that we're weird. Um, we get to think that maybe it's going to be a burden on them. We'll think that they don't have time. Uh, we'll think that, you know, they'll just make, they'll make fun of us or they'll think even if I wanted to, I wouldn't know how. And, or he'll even get us to think that God's just really, you know, T tired of hearing us go on about the same thing that we're just nagging at this point and we should just give up. You know, he gets us to discount what God can do in our lives that is ultimately life changing simply by his mercy, his grace, and his love. So go on and get you some already what God wants to give you and pray in the name of Jesus and watch what happens. The Holy Spirit will prompt you to ask for prayer. 
or either if it's from a friend, a coworker, whomever, to intercede on your behalf and to pray with you and or for you. It's a prompt because the Holy Spirit wants you to pull the trigger. Look at it this way, a gun will not fire unless you pull the trigger. So pull the prayer trigger already and stop doubting our living, all-powerful, true God. That said, we need to stop looking at giant obstacles and determining them as dead ends. We need to stop looking at difficulties as defeats instead of future victories. We need to start looking back at all the wonderful things that Jesus has done for us. We need to start looking at what God is doing for us currently in our lives and all around the world. And we need to start looking more in how God wants to use us as in get us to open ourselves more to him so that we can be used to our fullest potential the way we were designed to be. And we need to start entrusting him more so that any fear that gets instilled in us can be squashed in the name of Jesus because he gives us that authority and you can verify that in the gospel of luke chapter 10 verse 19 and in the book of james chapter 4 verse 7 and you'll find more from there and lastly we need to trust more that what our eyes pick up and translate into our head isn't exactly always going to be the end result as far as what we think it's going to be we're not always meant to understand everything hence the necessity of trust and obey just like we tell our kids to do the same if they don't want to have a hard time so you think we would learn the same and save ourselves from a hard time to help you out with that reflect on the book of proverbs chapter 3 verses 5 and 6 where it says trust in the lord with all your heart and do not lean on your understanding because you're not always going to have it just be fine with that already and me too <laughs> and in all your ways acknowledge him and he will make straight your paths all right guys let's have a little peaceful exhale here and let's get started all right so let's get started i have my edges pre-painted already because i don't want to really have to worry about you know the hassle of trying to touch up the edges afterwards so I figured just go ahead and paint them in. And so let's go ahead and put the base color down. So I'm going to add some Prussian blue hue. It should be enough. Oh. Sometimes it's kind of hard to tell how much, you know. Anyway. And my paints have a lot of bubbles because I just shook them up to give them a good mix. All right, so I'm going to spread this out here. This is pretty opaque, so I don't really think there's gonna have any, there's gonna be any issues really of um, white coming through as far as the canvas. Let's see here, and it dries really dark too. I know you guys can't see the side, but it does dry on the darker side, which is good because I like how it will make all the other colors just really bright, you know. Okay. And it makes it look like even more of an abyss, you know, just because under so deep into the water, you know, the sea and the ocean and all that, whatever, it's literally pitch black. And so, although this won't dry pitch black, it'll be pretty darn close. Um, okay, so I'm gonna just wipe this here. Okay, that's good for now. All right, so my torch has really been finicky. Yeah, it's gonna be finicky. There we go. <laughs> Only 12 times. Okay, torch some of that. Oh my goodness. All right, we'll worry about that later. And as far as the rest of them, I think there's gonna be a few more popping up. Yeah, I see some. Okay, at least I got the majority of them out. So I'm going to then do the uh, phthalo blue. Kind of randomly pour. Now that I realize how many of the colors I have left, I hope I'm not gonna put too much down. Then turquoise blue. Kind of thinking if I want to do a little bit more just because I like no, no wait. Don't get ahead of myself. <laughs> Alright, then some silver. 
hopefully this won't get lost. I find sometimes, actually more times, more often than not, when I use like my accent colors, they just get lost. <laughs> and so the next time I feel like, well, maybe I should use more and then it just, it's overpowering, you know? Mm, yeah. Let's see. Alrighty. And then some white for highlights, of course. Okay. All right. Now. Let's see, I think, oh yeah, I'm gonna put a little bit more base color down here. And then I, that way when I blow it back up, it's got, you know, a good amount to help it flow back up into the negative space here. So let me go ahead and blow this down and then of course blow it back up again. And you will see if it looks just as beautiful as Grace Godowna's. Yeah, I'm glad I didn't go back and put more turquoise in because I think that would just be too much. But I'm loving this cell action here. I'm going to make a few tweaks. Yeah, some more of that phthalo blue. I'm not really a big fan of this right here. try the blow dryer one more time. Yeah, that's not, there we go. like because there's more white coming through but hmm. this is the kind of like hard part of it you know just to kind of figure out how we're gonna make this like become the masterpiece you know what I mean so let me torch here because I see some more bubbles and it just might help bring up some more colors underneath hopefully couple times to ignite this one. Oh, yay, right away. <laughs> All right. Let's see. Okay. 
like that. Actually, I think that's, I might make a few tweaks, one or two more tweaks and then give you guys a close up because I, I would say it's pretty much about done. I love how this is super bright and then just really dark right here. The contrast is amazing. Love it. All right. Yeah. Let me make one or two tweaks and then bring you for a close up. All right, you guys check it out. Here it is. Close up. I love the cells. Oh my gosh. Really, really pretty. The blues are just so vibrant and I love how they blend together really softly. I was looking back at it after I put the video on pause thinking, what else can I do? And so as you can tell, I just drug my finger through the paint in like a swirling motion to just get these little details here love it and i only just did a few of them i didn't want to swallow up my painting with a bunch of swirls i just wanted a few extra hints of movement in the composition um, to really complement all these cells which to me represent like bubbles rising to the surface so and I thought too, what a great way to kind of set my painting apart from Rinska Downis, since I basically duplicated her color palette and her method to achieve the composition. So I'm glad how I just dip, made a few little different tweaks in here. Now the lacing here is super pretty. I love it, but it's been kind of stretching and I hope it doesn't really get any bigger than that. I hope it stays kind of yeah just no bigger than that because then it would be overstretched and then you know not really too as much as i was hoping the other tweaks i did i kind of broke up the top portion here into like different segments you know i thought before it was just too i don't know it was too uniform it wasn't broken up enough and therefore i thought it just kind of added different features to the composition. It is a little gold heavy, but I'm actually okay with that because I feel like it breaks up the colors and it's pretty much right in the center anyways, making it a great focal point. So when it dries, I know that's going to be a very, very beautiful, shiny spot to attract the eye. And then it will just take the eye traveling all throughout the rest of the composition. So yay. All right, guys. So Take one little quick look-see and then stand by for the dried result. So here it is, you guys, all dried. And I thought I'd give you a couple of different angles and to see that the silver and gold clearly did not vanish, thank goodness. And I love how the silver came through, especially. You'll also note a few additional tweaks in the composition and that's because I had to move my painting while it was still drying. And so I ended up smudging it in a few places. Thankfully, nothing major. I moved it because I brought my son's Lego table into my art room to work on that because it's a little bit bigger. And he wanted to use it, so I felt bad. You know, I wanted him to have it. So of course I ended up compromising my painting while moving things around and I didn't get mad at him or even myself. Um, it's, of course, it's his table and I was thinking, well, this is what you get, you know, when you move a painting around when it's not completely dry. So with a few extra finger swipes and swirls, well, just one extra swirl, but to me, it actually, everything collectively, I think improved the overall composition. At least I think so. So maybe it was meant to be that I handled it too early. I don't know, just saying. Anyways, also take note of the color shift on the Prussian blue hue here and how significantly darker it is. Hopefully now it looks more like an abyss with bright underwater movement and chaos going on, so to speak. All right, brethren, this concludes this demo. And if you liked it, please be sure to not only share it, but to also hit like and subscribe for more videos. But more importantly, Remember to thank God for this opportunity and always paint from the soul. See you next time. Bye.